Hello people, we will just give it a minute or two. I'll let a couple of you log on if anybody's uh, going to be tuning in to watch this. And uh, I'll begin yapping very shortly. I've um, got a couple of things I want to cover. I've uh, got a busy few weeks ahead, so uh, I'm going to be uh, mentioning a few things in this. I might not be able to do another live stream for a couple of weeks yet, so I'll do this one, and this will probably be the only one for a little while. So, um, yeah, I'm doing it now while I've got opportunity, because I don't think I'm going to have opportunity after this weekend. So, right, um, there's a few things I want to cover. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Vectrex today, so anybody who is familiar with this might be of interest to you. Anybody who isn't familiar with this might also be of interest to you. Um, but there's some quite interesting developments going on in recent years which I want to talk about. So, um, yeah, I'll just give it a moment for a couple of people to log on, have, a, have me a drink and then... Uh, once a few people have logged on, I'll start gassing away. Hopefully you won't get disconnected. My internet's playing up a little bit here at home. Um, should be okay for this stream now. I might switch over to my 4G if it becomes problematic. Let me know if there's a problem with the stream. I'll have me a game while I wait for a few of you to log on. I'll have me a quick game. And then I'll get gassing when a few of you have logged on. Let's give this a try, eh? just joining us I'm just waiting for a few people to log on and then I'll start talking so nobody misses anything important you can always watch these videos back I leave them uploaded on my page and I'll link to them on my personal page as well but uh, if you're joining live you want to ask any questions I'm just going to leave it a couple of minutes for you to log on and then I'll start talking so you don't miss any of what I'm trying to tell you and you can ask questions as we go all right um, I can see a couple of numbers adding up now so as soon as I finish this round, I'll properly start talking. But I've got a good flow going here, so let's just see if we can beat stage one. How's it going, Az? You alright, mate? Enjoy the video I sent you earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, uh, come on, I'll get to this. Come on, come back. You know, I think Space Invaders is one of those love-hate games. You either love it or you hate it. Personally, I love it. Ah, too slow. One more. Boom. <laughs> right. Okay. I'll let that play out. Gizzy indeed as. <laughs> Right then guys, a couple of you jumping on now. So um, yeah, I'm gonna start gassing. So uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, this, which is the MB Vectrex. Um, it actually goes under a couple of different brands, depending on where you are in the world and when you bought one of these. Uh, if you're in the UK, you're most likely to see it under the MB brand. It was released here under Mitchells and Butlers. Originally it was under GCE. Um, if Chris Parsons jumps on, he'll probably be able to give you a bit more information than I can. But you can see this one is fully branded up with the MB logos. Uh, the, GCS, the GCE version is the original, but it's a bit more plain. It's got very grey writing. Looks quite drab. I much prefer this kind of colourful look. Seems like it's quite a, a black system generally. So... <coughs> Right, so yeah, there's uh, for those of you who don't know, the uh, the Vectrex was released in 1982, and it was a very well, it was and is probably the only system really of its kind. Um, it was released as a home arcade, and touted as such, 
uh, at a time when the, the closest you could get to a home arcade experience was something like the Grandstand Tabletop LCD games, uh, which obviously aren't true arcade games, didn't have proper graphics, and obviously we didn't have the technology, we didn't have the power in the chips to create small, affordable uh, systems which brought the arcade experience home. Certainly not the look and the feel of an arcade a, arcade machine. Uh, we did start to see arcade ports to the early consoles and the early computers over here, but we certainly didn't get anything even close to the arcade experience. Now, the uh, when GC came up with this, they obviously that they hit the right note, but you know the eighties was a tough time, so it was always going to be a bit of a hit and miss as to whether it would actually sell well when you've got competition from, you know, microcomputers were starting to be pushed in the, you know, in the West. They were big business in the early 80s. Uh, consoles, the, the cost of ROM chips and things like that was really expensive back in the day. So, you know, it, we, we kind of sat in a weird position. Uh, I believe when this system came out, it was around the, I think it was around the £150 mark. Uh, which if you adjust that for inflation, you know, probably adds up to a few hundred pound in today's money. So it would have been a lot more expensive than, you know, other systems at the time. Uh, and as a collector system now, it's not exactly cheap. So, I mean, what do you get for that money? Well, the system itself is a compact all-in-one system with a vector screen so it doesn't produce raster graphics. The reason vector games were popular back in the day is because you were able to create very convincing graphics that animated super smooth uh, compared to what was what was possible with raster graphics and full color back then. And uh, the way the, the games worked was it would draw individual points on a screen and then draw them with lines and it would create much smoother graphics than you would get you know, on a raster display. So, um, arcade games like, um, I'm trying to think, Tempest, Star Wars, um, Asteroids, uh, that they all used uh, vector graphics. Obviously, they used colour vector graphics, but it was a bit expensive to bring that home. Um, so, when they, when they brought this home, obviously, their intention was to bring, back, bring home those style of games. And I guess at the time, they would have been far more impressive than a lot of things that have been ported to home consoles. Uh, the system itself uh, stands about 14 inches high uh, and I think it contains, if I'm not mistaken, a 9 inch vector monitor in a vertical orientation. Uh, obviously a lot of games of the early 80s, especially well late 70s, early 80s, used the vertical orientation for a lot of the games, whether it be raster or vector and so they decided to go with that um, for, the, for the layout. Makes a lot of sense, it actually made the system a little bit more compact than it would have been if it was horizontal I suppose, and made it stand out apart from just looking like a standard monitor. Uh, the system itself is housed in the bottom with the monitor in the upper section. Has a cart slot on the side of the system there. Uh, it's got a carry handle at the back and it just plugs straight into the mains. Down at the front, You've simply got a you've got a power slash volume switch, which is a rotating dial that clicks on, clicks off, and the further you turn it up, it adjusts the volume. You've got a reset button just there that you can tap to reset to go back to the the start, and then you've got two joystick ports in the front. The controller that comes with it is a quite an advanced affair for the time it's got four buttons you know at a time when console games would generally only, would generally only have you know one button available two at most perhaps and uh, it's actually got a proper analog stick as well now it's a little bit loose uh, and a lot a lot looser than you'd be used to by today's standards but of course not many people were doing this back then and i can understand why they went with analog because you know some of the earlier arcade games uh, were analog before they were digital, you know, things like Pong and things like that. Um, it's quite a nice profile. It can be a bit daunting to some people to know how to hold this. I mean, there's a few ways you can do it. If you're a, a big, you know, handy person like me, you can hold it like a controller and kind of use this like a thumbstick. 
although you don't get the greatest range because you have to stretch quite far to go from left to right. Uh, and then you can tap the other buttons, although reaching one is quite a stretch. Um, and then of course, the alternative is to put it as it should be, like an arcade panel flat on the table like this. And uh, holding it, well, whichever way you can, but the stick is very short to hold it like a proper joystick. So it can be a little bit fiddly for some people, especially if you've got bigger hands. It's connected to the system by a sprung cord, much like a telephone cord. And the entire system quite handily contain, is a containing one unit. You can basically tuck all this away like so. And there's a couple of catches there. And then you can fold this up and it folds flat against the front and clips in. So the controller contains well with the system. You can buy second controllers and plug those in, obviously, but there aren't a great many great many games that used um, two, you know, had simultaneous two-player play to use two controllers. So um, you won't have seen that much of it. <coughs> so um, as far as the games go, um, I mean, there I think there were only ever something that there were probably around about fifty or sixty games ever released for the system. Not a massive amount by any stretch of the mind. Um, some of the games uh, you would most likely know um, or be familiar with at least. Uh, it came bundled with a game called Mindstorm, which is basically an Asteroids clone. Uh, although a little bit more advanced th than Asteroids with uh, various ship types and things to contend with. It's quite quite a cool game and it's built into the system. It's one of the best games for the system if you ask me. And you get you get decent analog control on that. Um, it, it's it's it takes a little getting used to on this controller, but it's quite a cool game. And um, yeah, and then from there you had games such as uh, there was a port, I believe, of Berserk. You know, if you played Berserk in the arcades, um, I think there were ports of um, Scramble. Um, I think there's a pole position port on here, if I'm not mistaken. There are quite a few games you would recognise, but it had its fair share of everything. There were there were platformers, there were racing games, um, there were you know top down shoot 'em ups. There were uh, well, there, there were all kinds of games. Basically, there were maze chase games. There were all kinds of games for the system, um, but it never really got. I wouldn't say it would got a killer app, if you know what I mean. I mean, there were certain peripherals you could get for this. There was a light pen which you could get. Um, which allowed you to actually draw on the screen, which was quite cool in, in an animation studio. Uh, there was also a 3D imager, which was kind of hard to come by. And there were two or three 3D games released for this, which used a um, anaglyph 3D effect. Uh, and they're, they're quite convincing if you manage to get hold of them. Uh, there are actually some reproduced versions of the headset that you use for that. But it's, it's kind of a trippy affair because it uses a spinning coloured disc and um, while you're using it, uh, it can be a bit nauseous because it's quite makes for quite a heavy headset, and you've got this this powered thing by your head. It's a little bit scary, but uh, yeah, the games do look very convincing in three D, uh, and hopefully, I'll get to experience it properly for the first time at Revival in a couple of weeks. Because up until now, uh, I've not had a good chance to do that. But I understand uh, Chris Parsons, Vector Republic, will be bringing along quite a lot of things to do with that, which brings me on neatly to where the Vectrex is at these days. Um, the Vectrex is quite an unusual system in that it's become more of an active and involved system since its demise uh, and, and more so with the, with the resurgence of retro in recent years than it ever did in its, in its operational, um, its, sorry, its profitable lifetime. And that's because it, I suppose it's very simple to to code for, um, you don't need to be a, you know a super whiz with graphics and things like that because you just need to know how to plot the graphics and because that they are vector they're going to be quite rudimentary compared to you know advanced raster graphics. Um, and people, as with every all other systems, people have created demos and found ways to do things with the system that never would have really been shown off in the early games. Uh, people have added some cool music effects. Some they've, they've utilised uh, the vector, the way the vector display is drawn to create some pretty cool effects in several games. 
and uh, there's a very active scene still developing new games for it, some of which are far above what you would have seen released back in the day. Um, and uh, the good news is, is, is that most of these games are available to buy completely reproduced as cartridges uh, or as ROM files. And uh, thanks to the fact that they've been producing multi-game carts for this thing for years, you can enjoy them all in one place for convenience if you want to. Um, I did originally have a multi-cart for this system, which I sold a few years ago, which was 72 in one multi-cart. And then some people started to create menu-driven multi-carts, which is uh, much better in my opinion. So I'm going to turn this off for a second and just show you what we're looking at. If you had a stock system, uh, push this across. A bit, a bit awkward the way I've got the camera here. One second. Let's just turn that off. And we'll pop the cartridge out. So, ordinarily, you would turn the dial on the front and until it comes on, be presented with the loading screen. Turn that down a touch. And because it's got the built-in game, it would automatically load Mindstorm from the off. And the annoying thing is it automatically starts a game whether you've pressed start or not. So you have to kind of go straight into it. than this <laughs> but yeah I mean you get very smooth graphics the way the way it uh, scrolls and rotates once you get good at it this is a really cool game to play um, but yeah really good built-in game there uh, and if you don't like the brightness you can actually adjust the intensity of the beams on the back so so that's what you present to do as normal um, the, uh, a lot of the early multi-carts, the multi-carts actually had dip switches built onto the cartridge. Um, the menu-driven ones are much better because obviously with the dip switches you can't change them uh, while it's kind of, you know, in situ or turned on anyway. Um, so you have to kind of look at a reference chart to see what's mapped to where and things like that. Uh, with a menu-driven multi-cart like this, this is the VEC Multi. This was probably the most popular one up until very recently. There's now a new one out called Vec Fever, I believe, uh, which is slightly better than this. This is the uh, Vec Multi. This was created by Richard Hutchinson, the same guy who does the Flash Boy Plus for the Virtual Boy and a couple of other devices as well. Um, you can see just inside there, I've got this rather nifty uh, clear cartridge shell from Chris Parsons. Um, you can see the actual circuit board doesn't fill the space entirely and you can see the SD card slot at the top. There's no need to actually pop it out, so there's no slot on the top. Um, and you can undo it with one screw anyway on the back there, so it's not a problem. Um, but this just houses it nicely in there. I'd, I mean to get a label made up for that, It'd be nice to do. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's only something like a 256 megabyte card. Vectrex ROMs are absolutely tiny, so it's easy to put everything on there that you want to. So, <coughs> once you've got that, Put that into the side and as important as it is with other systems you should never attempt to pull out or push in a cartridge on this i heard bad tales about something that happened at rcm where somebody uh, ripped out a cartridge and completely destroyed her vectrex machine there so yeah never do that particularly with this because quite a lot of voltage passes through it um you might be wondering what, what we're actually looking at there this is probably the way the Vectrex really showed itself off. Um, it had, because it only has black and white screen and black and white colours, um, you would be presented with, you know, quite a dull looking screen, I suppose, on uh, on first glance. So instead of having um, raster graphics, it had overlays, which is how a lot of the early arcade games uh, worked. Things like uh, Space Invaders, um, trying to think of examples now. I think uh, Boot Hill, um, I don't know, there's quite a few examples. They used to have like a gel overlay on there 
and that would actually create the illusion of colour, even if it couldn't create it enhance the graphics in any way, and would sometimes have uh, you know certain features draw physically drawn onto the gel that overlays onto it. And when you actually buy a Vectrex game, each game came with its own unique overlay. These are more hard to come by than anything else right now. And, um, you know, when you're buying second-hand games, you don't need this to enjoy the game. You can enjoy them all in black and white anyway. But I do happen to have a load of these where I'm keeping them safe. And there's no point with them out at events because if they get damaged, they're lost forever. Um, but, yeah, each game had its own overlay. And you could use the same overlay for quite a, quite a few things. But I'll talk more about the overlays in just a second. I'll just show you a couple of the games on here first and have a look at what you're seeing. No, I haven't got Vector Patrol yet, Swainy. I, um, I'm looking to get that. I'm, I'm looking to hook up myself with a few more new games very soon. But uh, for now, I just want to show people this. So uh, we've got the Vet Multi here. Uh, we've got this rather nice Starfield kind of effect going on. And um, you can see here... It goes by pages, you scroll left and right through the pages and then you pick the game you want to play using the appropriate uh, button on the controller here. Uh, and I think this has got about 30 pages worth of games, so that's what, uh, 4 times 30, that's like 120 ROMs on here. Some of the games are very similar, uh, this, this contains demos, it contains quite a few homebrews, it contains... Uh, all kinds of things. But it does have most of the main games on there. So, you know, um, I was talking about some of the, the release games. We'll, we'll have a look at a few of those just to show you uh, what you might have been dealing with if you'd have bought one from the shop. So, uh, I believe Bedlam is one of the original games for this. So, we'll just load that up. I will do, mate. I will do. And you can see with Bedlam, it's a kind of base defense game. You have to defend your spot, which I absolutely suck at. But yeah, I mean, you can see the games are pretty basic affairs. It would have been added to with the overlays you would have got with the game when you bought it, you know, as a, as a retail release. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're arcade oriented, oriented games, the kind of games where you need to. You know, they're high score based, that's the focus. And uh, I suppose once you spend some time with it and get good at them, you know, the kind of games that can become very addictive. Back in the day, like so, when this came out, you wouldn't have had that much choice available for, uh, for, for arcade style games of this quality. So, you know, it was, it was good to see. Uh, we'll check out a few more. Um, we'll show Berserk actually because it's on there. This is this one is obviously a lot closer to the arcade game because the arcade was done in, in vector graphics natively. A little bit slower, admittedly, but uh, still just as fun. Oh, there's Evil Lotto. Not letting him get me off the screen. There we go. And you can see just how smooth, you know, everything scrolls, you know. You wouldn't have got that with raster graphics at the time. Certainly not on things like the Atari 2600. Or in television or whatever was available at the time. Oh, I thought I'd got him. Um, I know a few people who are really big fans of this in the arcade. What's quite good is even though you've only got line drawing abilities... By changing the intensity of the beams, you can see how different effects are created. The sprites stand out more than the backgrounds. The lasers have got like a flare effect going on them. Uh, the enemy fire, I think, does the same. When you hit them, you get this sparkle effect, this explosion effect, which looks quite cool. Yeah, I do like a good round of Berserk when I've got time to sit with it and play that for hours. <laughs> Two retro gurus <laughs> you're chased by a swarm of bees. Not quite. <laughs> um, I noticed there's a couple of games on here listed as supporting the VEC voice. I think there was a voice synthesizer for this. Um, I don't have it. Um, 
let's have a look at a couple more games. Clean Sweep, I think, was one of the originals. If it lowers, yeah. That's one of the things about this flash cart. I'm not quite sure why, but I've been told it happens with everybody's vet multi. Occasionally, when you load a ROM, sometimes it just it won't load and you just have to reset it a couple of times and then it'll load. Don't know why it does that. Hopefully, I can get it to load. Sometimes you have to load another game first and then, well, there we go. We'll try this one out, Cosmic Chasm. Not actually played this one myself. Okay. Okay, so it's a uh, top down shooter of some description. I'm about to die. <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling that was coming. Um, yeah, I'd need to take some time with that and practice that, I think. So we can at least get through the next section. I'm assuming once that gets to the edge, it's no good. Oh, okay. Yeah, I really don't know what I'm doing on that one. <laughs> we'll try a couple more. Show something a bit different. I'll have a look at some of the uh, racing games that are on here. Um, let's have a look. Hyper Chase. We'll go for Hyper Chase. So you can see that moving at a decent pace. Gear it up. We'll attempt to. It's, this is quite a hard game to play. One hat, well, the angle I'm playing at anyway. And this has got full analog control. You can see me hitting the sides a bit hard. This has got full analog control for the steering. But once it starts to move at third or fourth gear, the pace is right up there. Anybody who's ever played the Tonytronic 3Ds, you know, racing game like this looks very similar to the racing game on there. So it's obviously you've got super smooth graphics on this. You'd have been hard pressed to get this kind of pace out of a racing game on other systems at the time. Certainly not as smooth as this. So it last more than a few seconds at fourth gear. No. <laughs> I absolutely suck. <laughs> so that's a racing game and I think we've got pole position on here as well. Um, and that looks find it. There we go, a pole position. Hope it's loud. There we go. It's got quite a cool little soundtrack. There we go, we've got a nice background, nice chunky car on this. This, of course, got analog control as well. A bit smoother again than Hyper Chase. A bit less mental. Only basic sounds in that, but as far as um, arcade accuracy goes, it's not far off. You know, it seems to scroll the same, move at about the same pace. Obviously, you haven't got the full colour. The overlay would add a little bit to this, but not too much. And you've got your, your two gear shifts, just like the arcade. Qualified. <laughs> Now the, uh, the effect you're seeing on the camera here, which looks like a rolling graphics effect, doesn't look like that in person. It actually flickers a lot faster than that to the naked eye. It looks a lot smoother. As you're looking at it now, that's how it looks to me, pretty much. Obviously when the action speeds up, it looks like it's rolling again to you. It's, it's pretty, the flickering is there, but it's a lot faster to the naked eye. So, might actually need a capping on this, it's looking a bit strong. So, anyway, um, that is pole position. 
So those are the kind of games you would have dealt with um, back in the day if you'd have been buying these straight from the shop. So as time's gone on, a uh, few things have changed and a lot of people have been working on other games for the system. Um, there's people been doing things from very basic to very advanced. Now, uh, I've mentioned Chris a few times. Chris has done several games for this that I enjoy. Big Blue is one of the games I actually covered uh, on my own personal page a couple of years ago. I'd like to show you a game, but I don't have the uh, the ROM on here. I've only got his original cartridge, which is upstairs in its collector's box, and it's going to stay there for a little while because <laughs> I can't get to it at the moment. Um, but that's a game you really should play. That's got unlockable features, and it's a bit more in-depth, you know, than just a high-score blast. Um, uh, but, yeah, there's, there's people definitely working on, uh, you know, later games for this who started working on them over the years. Um, porting games that didn't actually exist on here. Uh, one of them is this one here, which, if it loads, is Tsunami. And you can see that it talks about it being a free demo uh, done in 2000, 2002. It is basically a Vectrex port of, as you can tell, of Tempest. So we'll load that up. And obviously this is the perfect platform, really, to do Tempest on. You know, the arcade game was a... A vector game, the graphics weren't too complex, it was all about the gameplay. And even though this moves at a slightly slower pace than the arcade, this was the demo. I think the full version might have had a bit more detail to it, but it's still an enjoyable game to play. I, I was a big fan of Tempest back in the day. I I'd still really love an arcade machine, but at least you get to see the, the nice bright vectors on here. I think it's pretty cool. There you go, did level one at least. And, uh, you know, the way it fades in and out, the way it zooms in and out, it, it's just nice effects to see. You didn't you didn't get from any other console back in the day. Um, but, yeah, so that's Tsunami, anyway. Um, I do like that game. I could play that for quite a lot longer. Um, but then there were other people doing some even more trick stuff. Now, even though you couldn't actually do uh, Rasta well, true raster graphics anyway with this, there's a few people who've kind of pushed the envelope a bit and they have they have actually managed to um, create raster graphics of a sort. One of them is the what you saw when you first loaded up this video. And that is this one. Um, Protector and Yassi, if it will load now. Should bloody load. I've been playing it all day, so... Back to it. There we go. And as you can see, you've got very um, Konami style, you know, that familiar font that you would have seen in most arcade games, which obviously would be hard to do in pure vectors. And you get this rather cool raster graphic kind of effect that is cleverly done. And this was only done a couple of years ago, as you see, 2005. What's clever about it? I mean, listen to the music. It's far above what was being done with the other ones. Now, on this cartridge, there's a couple of games. Um, you might not guess what they are purely by their names, but Protector is a port of the arcade game Defender. And Yassi stands for yet another Space Invaders. A lot of people attempted to do Space Invaders clones for this system, which didn't turn out very well. Yassi is arcade perfect. The way the sprites are drawn, the way the enemy movement is, the difficulty levels, everything is arcade perfect. And I love Space Invaders. I think it's one of those games where they love or hate, and uh, I happen to love it. So, um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of this. It's probably my favourite game to play on here. So we'll load up Defender first, well, Protector, should I say. And we've got that Williams uh, funky flare effect there. And the, yeah, the ship looks a bit more basic, but you've got the same affair. You've got your thrust, you've got your, uh, your laser, you've got your smart bomb, and the aim is still the same to protect your dudes on the ground. I always sucked at Defender, but I'll be honest, I much prefer playing it 
on uh, on a joy on a joystick with um, rather than two different with just, sorry a four way joystick than I do with a two way joystick on the arcade. Uh, this plays a bit more like the arcade, which it is a nice joystick to play with, and it's got some really cool effects. You can see the detail there of the uh, the actual play field where all the enemies and your the guys you're trying to protect are. So yeah, anybody who loves Defender should absolutely love that game. Um, now we'll put my initials in, I don't think it saves. So we'll reset that, we'll go back to it and we'll play the game which I wanted to discuss originally. If it loads, <laughs> second time lucky. There we go. Wait for its main menu, and we hit two. And it asks you to align the bars, and I found the best setting for mine is Q. I think it's something to do with the way it aligns the uh, aligns the um, the vectors to look like um, raster. So let's load that up. Oh, I wanted to go into it now. Here we go. And you can see you've got the different grades of um, of actual attackers there, the actual invaders. They're, they're all shaded slightly differently. They do appear, what it is, is very fast, fast drawing vector lines that are creating those images. You can't, it doesn't pick up too well on camera. But they're, they're all made up of what looks like very, very fine scan lines. And uh, it doesn't affect your eyes at all while you're playing. You think it might do. But the bases, the enemies, and your ship are all made up of that. Hidden text at the top. But the effects are all there. The speed change and the enemies as you destroy them are all there. You might have saw, if you logged on at the very start of the video, you might have seen me complete a stage of this. I'll, um attempt to now I think and then I will show you what else has been going on with the system yeah game over so so um, yeah so cool little system now when I mean, I've spoken a little bit about the fact that this system has seen a bit of a resurgence in recent years and has had you know has got um, probably got more squeezed out of it in recent years than it ever did while it was still profitable. Uh, like I say, it's, it's quite an affordable system to service, to look after and to own. Uh, the games are all very arcade derived, so if you like your arcade games, you're very well catered for on here. You've got a flash cartridge available, uh, and so um, it's developed its own kind of cult following in recent years. And I'd say for about the last 10, 15 years, I mean, I only re really kind of started to discover it in the last five or so, although I was aware um, about 15 years ago people were doing new things for it. And uh, people have been doing all kinds of funky things. I mean, I've talked a, bit, a little bit about Chris Parsons of Veta Republic. Um, he's making new games for it. Um, there are people out there creating modifications for the system. Um, one of the modifications you can get, if I go very close, you might just about be able to hear a strange buzzing noise as the intensity of the beams on the screen change. And um, you can't avoid that. It's, it's, it's something to do with the lack of shielding between the, uh, the speaker and the, uh, what actually creates that. Now there is a there is a device you can get called the buzz off which will eliminate that. I my system was didn't do it too badly to start with, but the more it's been used for events and the more I've used it, I've found now that uh, especially having the brightness turned up quite high, you have to turn up a little bit higher for the games on here because of the way it draws the screen. Um, it does put a strain on the system, and I could do with getting the buzz off fitted to it now. Uh, but there are other things that you can get for the system. There's one called the Audio Tap, which will allow you to output the sound to external speakers. And if you've been to revival events before, you will have seen Chris Parsons with that kind of setup. There are uh, controller adapters you can get to use a Mega Drive pad with this because 
buying a replacement control pad now is very hard to do they're quite expensive to get and um yeah they, they do need a little bit of servicing my analog stick here has gone a little bit sloppy i could do with giving this a bit of a touch up and i probably will do seeing as i've brought the vectrex home to give it a touch up anyway um but yeah there are custom joysticks being made for this custom spinners custom um steering wheels and joysticks flight sticks things like that um there's, there's so many things being made for the system it's unreal uh people are making their own overlays for the system uh for the custom games that they've got and um yeah the, the community is very very active for this there are people buying carts regularly for it um prices have held pretty stable for it you can you, you can buy one of these now for about 150 to 250 pound depending on whether it's loose or or boxed there is a custom carry case for it if you've got one that's in good condition with a nice bright active screen that's not fading um then yeah you're looking to pay up to, up to about 200 pounds for a decent worker uh the prices hold really well uh, and if you go to the right people they are quite serviceable as well i had two at one point i gave one away i bought it um knowing it may have been damaged purely because it came with quite a few games and a load of the overlays so it was worth it just for the overlays you can pay 10 15 pound for the overlays on ebay so it was totally worth it now like i say in recent years people have been doing some funky things with it and one of the most recent ones to come out is what i've been trying to show you so far if i just turn the system off for a second You'll notice that the system appears to have something very odd on the front and that is actually a modification. Uh, the system itself uh, actually stops at the front there and kind of uh, tapers in, in towards the screen. This is a panel that goes over the front. It's one of the newly created uh, panels and uh, our friend James up in Scotland has been doing these. Uh, and he's only recently created them. A few people out there have now bought them. And um, I've only seen them so far as a 12 volt version. What it actually is, is a, it's a Perspex section that just fits over the front of the system. But just inside, if we can try and get a shot of it, um, we'll try and turn the flash on. If we go just inside there, you'll see there is actually a mounted strip of ultraviolet LEDs, which goes down to the bottom. You can see the power jack there for it. And it goes around the inside. And there's some up that side as well. And then it's joined by a strip that goes across the top there. And it's simply attached to the system by a set of self-adhesive Velcro pads. And the reason, um, the reason for this um, is because it will catch UV lights onto the screen, but you don't want them beaming in your face. So the, the angle they're at, they're casting perfectly onto the screen. Now, the reason this has been created is because um, UV can create quite a, few, quite a few cool effects. And I've already mentioned the overlays. Now, people are creating overlays for various games. Um, now, if you look at this, it doesn't look like much on face value. It just looks like a coloured gel. If I tilt this just towards the light, you can see just about on the system. This is what I've had up while I was playing Space Invaders. These overlays have recently been created by a guy called Lawrence Benyon. Uh, who's kind of worked with James, I think, to create this cool effect. And they're, they're basically um, like more detailed more graphical arcade overlays that react to uv light and um, they've been creating these for people recently and there's a whole series of these you can get and uh, james has hooked me up with the led system and lawrence has hooked me up with a few of these i did want to, i only wanted to buy a couple of things but they've hooked me up with a few more which i'm going to show you now so this is um space invaders um i've got the pack here you can see, there we go. Lawrence's little company there is Vector Exceptional. Uh, and they do UV posters and things as well, I think. And um, we've got a set of care instructions which actually tell us that 
Unlike some of the other um, gels for the screens, these are not sealed, um, so you do have to be careful not to get them wet, I would think, um, because I said if they laminated too many layers, the UV effect on the UV layer they've added wouldn't be very effective, um, so they're not waterproof, but they're, they're not like susceptible to sticky fingers or anything like that, as much as you might expect. They still feel very similar to normal ones, um, but yeah, they look really, really cool. Um, I'll just show you a couple of the other ones I've got and then I'll turn the system back on and show you uh, what they, what the other ones look like as well. So I'll move Space Invaders over. Um, move the first layer. Put that back on there. I'll pop this off, let's see what we've got next. Okay, so the next one here, even though the colours look the same, if you look in the reflection there, Anybody who knows their arcade games should recognise this. This is the overlay, I believe, to Asteroids Deluxe. And um, this shows up really well in the UV. Um, you can see the reflections in the light there. I'll put that on a minute with Mindstorm or with Asteroids and show you how that looks. The, the level of detail on these is absolutely stunning. And even though in the light there you can see certain amounts of what looks like scratches on the screen from the lamination process, you don't see any of that during gameplay. Um, obviously, you can't really wipe these damn pelts. They will, you know, it could ruin them. So um, you just got to kind of live with those being there. But it doesn't affect the way the UV effect looks on the screen. So it's not a problem at all. Um, uh, those were the two I actually ordered. And then Lawrence actually said he would hook me up with a couple more. And so he sent me some rather Tron-like cool effects here. This one is the sphere grid, which is kind of a distended um, circular grid from a flat grid in which the lines light up in the UV. And we've got one more here, which is the, I think this is, yeah, this is the uh, square tunnel grid. Um, which kind of zooms into the background. You, you can't even see this one in the in the light above me, so I'll have to actually put this one in place to show you. It's got very fine lines, and it looks really cool. So we'll pop it back on, and I'll pop on a couple of games that will show these off. Obviously, the first two that I showed you... Um, sorry, I should talk a bit more about this UV overlay. Um, the UV overlay, this is the 5-volt version. This is the first time I've seen a 5-volt one in action. Uh, James built these to be 12 volt, um, 12 volt LEDs with the, with the idea that you power it from an external power source. Um, I think the idea behind that obviously is that it allows you to continue with uh, having two player games uh, because you can power the, uh, power the LEDs externally and also because the 12 volt LEDs have got slightly more intensity and apparently the strips you could get, the LEDs are more tightly packed. now. This, I, re I requested the 5 volt version and that's because when it comes to doing events or at home and things like that, I don't want a million things plugged into power sources here. 12 volts isn't a lot, but it's another socket on a plug bank and I don't really want to do that. So I've requested the 5 volt version and what we get is down the bottom corner there, you can see, uh, I'll just turn the light back on, you can see the uh, plug there, which is like a standard jack, probably center, uh, center positive, and it just goes there into the second player joystick port, and it draws five volt power straight from the second player joystick port up to there. James was concerned it wouldn't be bright enough and was curious to see how it would look. Uh, and even with just six LEDs either side, as you've seen on this video, it shines just perfectly. I mean, yes, I'm showing you this now in a darker evening setting, but I've, tr I've, I've tried it in the day and it looks just as good. It may not be as intense as the 12 volt one, but it's a damn sight more convenient. And even though this frame may appear cumbersome face value, I can assure you that whilst you're playing the game, um, you don't notice any of this. It fits to the exact uh, border of the um, Vectrex bezel area anyway. So it doesn't overhang uh, at the bottom or the sides or anything like that. You can detach it quickly, like I say, it's attached by Velcro sticky pads, although I'm not going to remove it now. 
so I'll probably make a bit of a pig's ear of it, trying to get it back on. And um, yeah, it just sits there quite aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, and you can see the screen from a decent angle all round. And because of the way it's designed with a slight overhang, the LEDs don't shine in your face when you're head on from, head on with it. Uh, and like I say, yeah, I, I favour this 5 volt version because I like the convenience that it's taking power directly from the system, but doesn't need to be hardwired in. So. I'll show you a couple of games now. I'll turn the light off on, oh, light off, light off on this. Um, I'll show you a couple more games with the different UV backgrounds and show you which ones will work best. So we will start with the one you couldn't really see in the light, which is the it's the Tron Light Tunnel. So the, uh, the overlays just sit behind a little lip there and under the top. Let's put that into place. That should do it. I'll turn this on. And yes, the effect is a lot weaker on this one than it is on the others, but you can just about see the square tunnel grid that goes down. Like I say, this isn't the most intense effect one. This is more of a subtle effect that you might want to choose on a game I don't know, perhaps like the one I was showing you, was it um, Cosmic Chasm, I think it was, um, or Bedlam. Let's try Bedlam. And you can just about see the way the all the colours, you've got red, blue, green and yellow, I think. The way they look under the UV light, you get this kind of, almost like, you know when you've magnetised a screen and you get the kind of funky colour blur? You get that kind of effect and it might look a bit strange in the middle of the screen when you're actually playing the game it just adds that little bit of color that makes it interesting and you can see that head on you don't see the um the uv leds you only tend to see them once you start moving off to the side like that they'll be in your face or the reflection in the screen there you don't generally see them in normal play you know face on like this so they're not they're they're not distracting. They're not giving off loads of uh, UV radiation or anything like that. Um, so yeah, we'll just quickly throw on bedlam. And you can see the different colours as it goes to the extremities of the triangle. And uh, I think it looks quite cool. You know, you've got the the grid effect going on. Um, I'll switch to the spherical grid because I think you'll actually show that one up a lot more on camera. So I'll just quickly pop this out. Damaging it. There we go. Pop that out. Try and just carefully putting these down, guys, so I don't. Don't get them smudged. I've got them layered between pieces of paper on the table here. Uh, yeah, I'll we'll switch to this one. This one should show a bit more because the lines are a bit more, a bit more vibrant. There we go. You can really see this one. Um, this one looks really cool. Let's get in the right position. There we go. I mean, you can see the intensity of the grid on there. Might not work for all games, but if I go to something like, um, let's find a good example. If I go to something like, oh, I don't know, is it Clean Sweep I was on just? It'd probably be very, very apt for this. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea. Sorry, clean sweeps the Pac-Man clone. I'm forgetting my games here. <laughs> but yeah, you got that kind of cool UV overlay. It's just a very 80s look, you know what I mean? And I think it looks cool. You know, on the on the right choice of games with the right overlay, these effects can look really good. And yeah, I I uh, I quite like this. I quite like this one. I mean, you can see how well. Those lines show up there, and I'm not even close to it. The LED is really showing up the intensity of those. There's, there's several grid effect ones you can actually get. There's one which is more like um, a circular tunnel, which looks really cool. There's one which looks like uh, 
like a chip, but like a bit like the Matrix. It almost looks like um, there's one which looks like a cityscape from above. And I suppose depending on the choice of game, it can look quite cool. I mean, it looks like part of the graphics of the game, which is uh, which is nice. But yeah, so you know that looks quite good. And I will just jump back to asteroids, which I mentioned because. We've got the asteroids overlay, so we might as well show that one off in all its glory. Let's pop that on there. Pop that on there. And we'll pop this one in. And we will go to, in fact, I'll go to asteroids first, and then you can see the difference it makes with the screen in place. It's not called asteroids, it's called is it Vectroids. Trying to find it. So what we'll do, we'll go with Mindstorm because uh, Mindstorm is actually virtually the same game. Mindstorm 2, in case you're wondering. Uh, the original Mindstorm. <clears throat> the original Mindstorm um, had a problem uh, with it would only you'd go to a certain level and then it would crash. So they released a physical cartridge version called Mindstorm 2, and the only difference is it adds um, it adds like a bug fix to get past that stage. So as you can see here, um, if you've ever played the arcade version of Asteroids Deluxe, this will look very familiar. Although the arcade versions tended to have a reflected overlay, which gave the more of an illusion of the uh, the graphics being overlaid on top of the graphics, with this one you do get the you don't don't quite get that impression because the vector graphics are appear appear to be underneath the graphics. But the intensity is bright enough that it doesn't distract from gameplay. And you do still very much get that arcade feel, you know. You can see the gra graphics clear enough. You've still got a star field there. But you can see the detail that's in these. This has still got the graded red, blue, green and yellow uh, background. But it's also got, um, you know, quite detailed UV graphics for the meat, the uh, the meteor field and the, the ship that's in the foreground, just like... On the Asteroids arcade game, we'll play this a little bit just to show you. We'll attempt to. Oh, kill myself straight away. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good at this game. Right, stay in the centre. Let's get a grip on this. There we go. though but yeah I mean you can see just how strong the graphics look through this it looks really cool and you do get this layered effect which just adds I don't know it adds it adds a, a really good dimension to this you know the UV effect is really cool I mean the overlay is added to a lot of the games but they don't add to it like this does I mean this really sets it off and and gives it a kind of that pseudo 80s futuristic feel that you know, the 80s arcade games attempted to do, you know, 80s TV, 80s culture, try to give this pseudo-futuristic effect in everything they did. And, you know, this, you you know, utilising UV to add to uh, a game's graphics, it, you wouldn't even, it wouldn't even occur to you to do on games today, you know. And uh, it, it's such a cool effect to see in person. I mean, you've seen it on video here. In reality, you know, the purple is quite intense. It's, 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 it's quite surreal, and uh, if you like your arcade games like I do, and I love Asteroids, the arcade game, um, then playing it with like a proper overlay like this just really adds to the effect. I think the original overlay for this, for this game is, uh, is quite plain. I think it's just blue. You know, it's nothing special. This really is something special. 
Uh, and again, these modifications, they're not out of people's range. You know, people are making these games. I think they retail for about £20, the brand new games. Uh, could be a little bit more than that, tell a lie. Um, I think the overlays, I think, were £10 a piece, if I remember rightly, from Lawrence Benyon. If he's watching this, he can correct me on that. Um, and there, there's a whole range, and I think there's about 16 different styles to choose from. Uh, I've got four here that will serve my purpose. Like I said, the one doesn't show too well with the 5 volt LEDs, but I've seen it with the 12 volt LEDs, and it's really, really bright. Um, 5 volt is plenty, though, for these type of these type of overlays, and these are the ones that are really special. Hopefully, I'll do a few more that are as graphical as this. You know, I really like the the Moon one for Space Invaders because Space Invaders is one of my favourite games, and obviously Yassi on here is a superb port of that. Um, the LED um, frame, I believe, you can get from James, uh, and I, the, the cost actually escapes me right now, but he is on Facebook right here, James G Watt. And he's done several things for the Vectrex. Most recently was uh, Str Stramash Zone, I believe, which is a port of Battle Zone. And I've actually seen an overlay that's been developed for that, which has a lens in the middle, which zooms the scoping, which makes it much more like the, the arcade version. So, you know, people are doing some really trick things with the overlays, and it's really cool to see. So if, you want to, if, you, if you're thinking about getting a Vectrex and you really want to pimp it up, Get yourself a flash cart, get yourself some custom controllers, fit the buzz off kit, fit the um, the audio tap, get one of these UV overlays from James, uh, sorry, one of these UV um, bars from James, get the uh, UV responsive overlays from Lawrence, and you know, have yourself a, a cool little arcade experience. I don't think you could get as close to the arcade experience of this at home for any other kind of games from the time. Um, and this is a real piece of kit that was made at the time, you know, made in 1982, and it's still doing things to surprise us. This, honestly, is really cool to play this way. Um, I've not done uh, my obligatory plug, but <laughs> I'm going to mention it again here. Uh, Revival 2019 is in just uh, just over three weeks away now. We're going to have a massive Vectrex section there. Chris Parsons will have about five or six machines there doing all kinds of things, including his new game, which is based on Sheriff. Uh, called and the name's going to escape me now um, but yeah he's done a game based on Sheriff which for the Vectrex and it, it looks and plays really cool I've seen some demos of it and he will have full versions of that game there available to buy um, there'll also be some other mods on, on show there uh, people have now found a, a way to run uh, MAME through your Vectrex screen so you know that's quite cool be interesting to see how that develops but yeah, the Vectrex is a really cool system, and uh, if you like it, you'll be able to get your fill of it at Revival on the 15th and 16th of June. Uh, I hope to see you all there anyway, there's only a few weeks away now. I won't have time to do any more videos prior to that, I've got so much to organise. I've got logistics to do, I've got floor plans to finish up, uh, and I've got a lot of things to pay for. So um, yeah, but it's all for a good weekend of fun anyway, everyone always really enjoys the event. It's got, it's got, an, it's got an atmosphere like no other. And even if you've already been to events this year, I mean, come along to Revival. It's honestly second to none. It's the only pure retro gaming event this country's got. So please support it and we will be able to continue to bring it to you. Um, but anyway, yeah, signing off. I hope you enjoyed the video and um, I'll catch you all soon.